Hey guys, Pastor Ryan here uh, for day three of the Catechism of the Heidelberg Catechism. Uh, so just want to begin uh, whatever time of day you watch this. This afternoon it is for me here on Wednesday uh, to kind of review where we are going through the Catechism. Uh, just be reminded that uh, the Catechism is broken into 52 Lord's Days. Uh, and so there's just a few questions, usually two or three questions per week that are answered. So I um, want to be reminded that uh, it isn't the sum total of the teaching, uh, but just a small snippet uh, dealing with some Christian doctrines uh, that we are dealing with each and every week. So the questions for the first day, and I invite you to go back on the channel and look at, at some of these. So we looked more in-depth. Uh, from Lord's Day 1 is whatever, what is our only comfort in life and in death? And then what do you need to know in order to live and die in the joy of this comfort? One of the reasons why I want to stop and pause just a second on that second question is because uh, we need to be reminded that what the Catechism says we need to know uh, is first, how great my sin and misery are, second, how I am delivered from all my sins and misery, and third, how I am to be thankful to God for such deliverance. In other words, we know in the Catechism our sinfulness, our redemption in Christ, and then our call to Christian living uh, to become sanctified through God's grace as we live uh, the days of our lives. And so those are kind of the three sections uh, that are in the Catechism. Um, last week in Lord's Day 2, we began... Uh, diving into that first section about our sin and misery. And so that is where uh, we continue today, this third week, to talk about our sin and misery uh, on the Lord's Day 3. Before us uh, today, we have three questions, questions 6, 7, and 8 uh, from the Catechism for us. The first question is this, Did God then make man or humanity so wicked and perverse? And the answer comes to us, no. On the contrary, God created man good and in his image, that is, in true righteousness and holiness, so that he might rightly know God, his creator, heartily love him, and live with him in eternal blessedness, to praise and glorify him. At this time, I, I want to stop and pause, and I really want us to look at and consider um, just what it means for us who live this side of the fall, to be reminded of the way that God made us to be. Now, this world is not the way that God made us, made the world to be, that we are not the way that God made us to be. That the world was called into creation, called forth as God spoke in Genesis 1. And as God spoke at the end of each of those periods of creation, which he called days, at the very end, at the end of each of those, God said, it is good. At the end of all of that creation, he reiterates that and emphasizes it to say not only is it good, it is very good. And so I want us uh, to look at just a moment in, in Genesis chapter 1 uh, at that sixth day of creation, the day in which God made humanity, made man, male and female. And so on that day, uh, then God said, this is Genesis 1. Uh, starting in verse 26, Then God said, Let us make man in our image and our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. In other words, here we see that God has made humanity, even as he began to think and imagine about how he would make humanity, that we are called to be in relationship with God because we are made in the likeness, in the image of God. And also we are called to be in relationship to all of the rest of the created order. We are called to have a place of prominence and a place of leadership, a place of ruling over uh, all of creation from the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, the livestock, over all the earth, over all the creatures that move along the ground. So before uh, God even made us, God intended his intended purposes for us in our creation were for us to be in relationship with him as we are made in his image and in relationship with all of the rest of the creation. Verse 27, so God created man in his image and the image of God. He created him male and female. He created them. 
God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over every living creature that moves on the ground. So here we see that after God had made humanity, male and female, he created us uh, to be together. He lives out or he emphasizes, he tells Adam and Eve, as we call them later, he calls them to be fruitful and increase in number, to fill the earth and subdue it, to rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over every living creature that moves on the ground. In other words, the intention of God for us to be stewards of creation and rulers over creation, to be a, a, a caretaker, as it were, made in the image of God, the intentionality of which was mentioned in verse 26, here by the time we get to verse 28, is lived out in reality, and God speaks to Adam and Eve uh, to tell them that this is his intention for them. And so that intention becomes a command. So that is what we're called to do. But then we find that, that something else happens. And, and I want us to begin with uh, verse 3 of chapter 8. And I don't want to skip ahead too much here. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? In other words, and I don't want to get into that too much this week as that's not our intent and we have more to say about this. We need to be reminded that the intention of God was for us to be in relationship with him, for there not to be any separation. And so God would walk with Adam and Eve in the garden and he called to them even and he said he wanted to know, where are you? And so we get to the seventh question of the catechism. Where, from where then did man's depraved nature come? The answer is from the fall. The disobedience of our first parents, Adam and Eve in paradise. From there our nature became so corrupt that we are all conceived and born in sin. In other words, Adam is the head of us all. And in the sin of Adam and Eve, as they disobeyed God in the garden, we all, in that same day, in that moment, we fell dead as well. Now, it doesn't mean that, that, that in us falling dead in that moment, that at that moment we died. But what it means is that sin entered into the human experience in such a way that we are all born sinful. We're born sinners. We're born not just with the image of God, but we're also born after the pattern of of our parent, our parents, Adam and Eve, that we are like them and that we are not able to not sin. There's an old theological phrase that goes like this, that God made Adam and Eve uh, able to not sin. Posse non picare is what it is in Latin. They were able to not sin. They were able because they had free will. They had a freedom to obey God, to do what God had called them to do, to eat only the trees or the fruit of the trees that God had commanded them to eat from, and not the tree of the knowledge of good and evil of which they were not to eat. And they were free to do that. But you and I, all of us who have lived from Adam and Eve until now, and even our own children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren and those subsequent generations that come after us, we are all non posse, non picare. That is, that we are not able to not sin. Just try it for a moment. Try it for a day. Try to not sin. And what will happen is that you will become frustrated because none of us are able to not sin. It doesn't mean we want to sin. It doesn't mean we have a desire to disobey God, but it is impossible for us. And so there's a striving and there is a yearning in us. In fact, I would say that it is true that a great deal of our misery with our own sinfulness it's not that we desire to do bad. No, on the contrary. It is that we desire to do good, and yet we lack the power to be able to. And then it is said, and I nearly left this off. I didn't want to get too far ahead. But it is said that when we are redeemed, when Christ comes again, and when we go to heaven, or when heaven comes down to earth, that we will be 
non posse peccari, not able to sin, which is how we will live in our resurrected life. And we'll talk more about that, of course, later. The third question for us today, the eighth question of the catechism comes to us. But are we so corrupt that we are totally unable to do any good and inclined to all evil? And the answer comes, yes, unless we are regenerated by the spirit of God. All of us sin, all of us fall short of the glory of God. And what God's desire is, and what God's standard is, is perfection. And we are, we are not able to live up to that. But also what happens is that apart from regeneration, apart from God's grace at work in our lives, we are inclined toward evil. And that continually. That's the Anglican phrase, the Methodist phrase that I know. Uh, if you uh, come from a Calvinist background, you might know the term totally depraved. But it means that we would rather do what we want to do than what God wants us to do. And even when we do what God wants us to do, even when we desire that, the desire comes with some kind of ulterior motive, something in us that is for ourselves. And this is, this is the misery in which we live. The misery of, of wanting to do and trying to, in some ways, live out the intended purposes of our creation and yet being unable to. When I was a kid, I used to sometimes get a toy. It was perhaps the most simple toy that I've ever seen called a slinky. And the good thing about a slinky was I grew up in a house with stairs. And so, so the intention would be that you would start the slinky and the slinky would, would continue to, to walk itself down the stairs. And it's a, it's a pretty amazing thing. That's kind of what a slinky was intended to do. But inevitably, I, I would use the slinky in, in some sort of way that, that it wasn't intended to be used for. And I would twist it over on itself. And at some point, that slinky, which is essentially a spring, would become unsprung. And I would go to my parents and I would say, hey, can you fix this? And really, once a sprung is unsprung, you can't spring it again. It, it just can't carry out its proper function. And it's true for you and I. And so there is a frustration in our spirits because we are not able to live as we are intended to live. What we are called to do, we are unable to do. But I call us again, just like last week, back to the first question for us to be reminded of the hope that we have in Christ that we have comfort in life and in death. And that comfort for us, even in the midst of our frustration, is that we do not belong to ourselves, but we belong to Christ because he's purchased us, not with gold, not with silver, but with the blood of your son, Jesus. Well, I pray that you are, are well today. I pray that you are following along. Again, I would invite you to, uh, to follow along with the catechism, to even download your own catechism. You can just Google Heidelberg Catechism PDF. Um, they're available for free online uh, from several sources. And so um, I thank you for uh, the time that you, uh, that you uh, utilize, the time that you give up in order to be with me and to go through the catechism. So I pray that, that this finds you well and that, that things are good. So God bless you until, uh, until we see each other again next week. Have a good week.